Now, we at the Value Exchange spend a, a great amount of effort to make sure that uh, the concrete values and benefits and the outcomes of, of, of DLT are being understood across the market. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to be part of this event um, and to be able to spend the next, as I said, the next little while walking through real life examples, real life case studies with the experience of, of a really fantastic esteemed panel of people who, have, who are making DLT a reality um, every day. Now, that panel um, is, consists of Cathy uh, from uh, UBP, from the Union Bank of the Philippines. So Cathy, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we, we have Ben uh, from Stax, uh, who I'm sure is known to, to many of you. Thanks, Barney. And we have uh, we have Matt, who is both from the Singapore FinTech Association and from Deloitte. So we've got a, a double hatter in the room today as well. Hi, morning, everyone. So really, as I said, what we plan to do for the next little while, leveraging um, Kathy, Ben and Matt's experience is to walk through, uh, first of all, a quick bit of context in terms of really the landscape of, of this, you know, very fast changing technology and a very um, quick, you know, quick changing industry. Um, uh, so we're going to just run through a little bit of context and then we're going to go through um, some real life case studies around uh, green finance, trade processing, financial inclusion, trade finance to really bring the benefits of DLT and the real, tr real life considerations of the technology to life. Now, before we do that, I thought it was worth just kicking off with a few key headline stats, uh, a top five to get us in the mood, if you like. Um, now, this time last year, 79% of capital markets firms around the world um, had allocated resources to DLT. Um, so this is in an era of uh, COVID uh, as a COVID outlook from last year in an era of great uncertainty. 79% um, for me is a, is, a, is a staggeringly high number um, and I'll be interested to see what everyone thinks um, on the panel in terms of actually where that number is expected to have gone over the, next, over the last 12 months. But what's, what for me is really striking is that last year 1.6% of projects uh, in the DLT space were actually live. Um, so a tiny fraction with about, uh, and, and, and this is in the capital market space, with about 7% further in project mode. Um, and really, I think that, that that just is an excellent um, statistic that shows where we are in the evolutionary path of this of this technology. You know, we've many pilots out there with many sandboxes. Uh, many are award winning, uh, as I'm sure Ben will run us through. Um, but you know, for me, the really key thing is that we're now at a, at a really exciting juncture in 2021, where many of these pilots are now actually coming to fruition. And we are in a position to be able to talk with expertise about actually how these projects really work, how the fulfillment of those projects works, and actually really what success um, is driven by and equally what it's undermined by. Now, um, what for me is really telling is 57% of firms uh, really over the, last, uh, over the last couple of years have realized their DLT ambitions through acquisition and share ownership of smaller fintech firms more than by basically a kind of standard vendor customer relationship. Now, you know, I, for me, that's, that's a very telling stat in terms of the fact that, uh, again, that tends to happen in new technologies, but it is a very strikingly different adoption path from what we've seen in other areas. Um, and again, you know, I think for me, one of the interesting things in this conversation is gonna to be to talk about how relationships work around DLT, how the ecosystem works, and ultimately, is it really a vendor-client relationship or is it something more profound and, and deeper given the whole ecosystem play? Last of all, um, you know, I think the two last stats I would quote is that when um, uh, Tomasek uh, SGX uh, HSBC launched their bond issuance earlier in, uh, in 2020, the DLT platform that they used was able to remove about 2,000 or simplify about 2,500 operational processes. Um, in terms of you know start to finish from the issuance, um, equally um, the uh, trade processing um, example that Stacks uh, you know has, has has worked on with Eastspring and BNP um, removed about ninety six percent of trade breaks. So for me, if you put all of those five statistics together, you've got 
an era of great uh, maturing technology. You've got a real question around um, a talking point really around how that technology is realized in terms of people and teams and ecosystem. But you're starting to see some incredible statistics, 2,500 trade steps, um, you know, 96% of trade breaks being resolved. You know, we really are starting to see the concrete outcomes of this. And I think, you know, that, that is why conversations like this, drawing on the expertise of these panelists, is going to be so fantastic because this is no longer, I would say, a um, answer looking for a problem. Um, in fact, if we do our job right over the next hour and a bit, you should hopefully remember that it is certainly not that. But I think most importantly, um, problems are being fixed every day with DLT. Now, before I open it up to the panelists, I do just want to make one point that there is uh, a, a wide industry survey that's going on right now, um, led by the International Security Services Association, ISSA. Um, uh, and it's an opportunity for everyone around the world to benchmark their own DLT and blockchain plans against, uh, essentially against each other. Um, so we have uh, thousands of people feeding into this from um, the capital market space around the world. So if you would like to participate, if you'd like to benchmark your own DLT plans um, and receive a scorecard of essentially how you see your DLT projects against how your peers and competitors see them, please um, snapshot the, the, the QR code now or whatever the verb is for a QR code and um, take the survey. And uh, as I said, you will receive a, a scorecard benchmarking yourself from ISSA um, in about three, four weeks time when the survey closes. So do please make the most of that because I think in the context of making this conversation as impactful as possible, um, you know, we're gonna talk through our views, but ultimately it's gonna be really important in the development of DLT to build um, upon your views as well. So that's the context. Now, before I jump into the, to the conversation, I just want to walk through just very quickly that this conversation really breaks down into two parts. One is we're going to walk through, as I said, a bit of context and then um, a walk through some specific uh, deployment examples of DLT um, as, a, as a kind of conversation between the four of us here. Um, your questions will be welcome, but ultimately after this, we're going to cut into breakout rooms where each of us will be focusing on specific themes taking in your thoughts and having more of an open conversation around taking these taking these topics further. So um, we'll run through those later on. I'm sure you've seen them in the, in the invites, um, but that will be the second part of the conversation. So that's the preamble. Now, Matt, you're first. Uh, I was talking about DLT in terms of the rollout uh, and uh, the, the evolution of how we're moving. Um, I suppose, do you, First of all, does that resonate with you? And second of all, where are you seeing, you have this fantastic perspective of the industry from both of your, your hats. Um, are you, where are you seeing DLT in terms of the problems that it's really fixing today? Sure, thanks Barney. Um, so I think what you've, what you've said d d does resonate. I think what we see across the market is that the, the level of interest in DLT um, is no doubt increasing. The number of proofs of concept that we're seeing is also increasing, um, albeit there's perhaps still a, a bit of a lag in terms of the amount of solutions that we see going to a full implementation. Um, that's perhaps um, nothing too surprising. It's maybe just a function of the maturation of the technology, um, some of the business dynamics, etc., cetera, um, that feed into um, an implementation and and what financial institutions and other financial services stakeholders consider relevant when they're looking at this tech. Um, to my mind, in, in terms of um, what business challenges is DLT um, really involving, um, there's, there's perhaps two specific contexts, um, which I can cover from a, a very general perspective. The first is that DLT is particularly powerful and well suited to business models that depend on ecosystems. Um, the reason for that is if you look at some um, traditional supply chains, they typically require um, a parity in information to a, an a certain extent between stakeholders, but then perhaps being no central source of um, information storage or repository. Now, the technology can um, facilitate collaboration between um, multiple stakeholders and counterparties where it's helpful to have a single source of truth um, that can be accessed and verified in a secure way. 
um, and with stakeholders not necessarily becoming privy to more information than they need to fulfill their respective activities. So from a financial markets perspective, think things like trade financing, asset management, securities clearing and settlement, um, digital identity verification, um, even potentially real-time regulatory oversight. Um, and DLT can really enhance business models and activities by increasing security and data integrity um, and can also introduce operational efficiencies such as faster execution times. Now, to provide some, um, some real-world practical example, um, the Bank of International Settlements has estimated that around 800 um, billion US dollars of unproductive capital is locked up in the clearing system every day. Now, with DLT potentially being able to reduce or eliminate um, the needs for uh, clearing processes, um, that really puts a value to the type of um, upside that can potentially be received, uh, seen from a, a suitable implementation. Um, similarly, um, Accenture has identified that around 300 billion US dollars is spent every year on transaction costs, um, which could fees uh, potentially be um, reduced through more efficient processes. Um, and it's also been reported by the Financial Times that around 6% of financial trades in the EU actually fail to settle, costing counterparties up to 35 billion euros in penalties each year. Um, and with that really potentially being mitigable through an implementation of DLT-based processes. Um, just quickly, a second application of DLT um, uh, that, that is prominent um, is also um, as a result of DLT being able to automate middle and back office functions, which traditionally have been very laborious, non-profit generating um, Think here things like regulator reporting, payroll, tax information exchange. And in that context, the benefits um, of DLT deployment are perhaps more directly relevant in the nature of cost savings. Um, it's also worth, and I'm sure um, Ben and the rest of the panel will be able to comment on this in more detail, but DLT using smart contracts is very highly tailorable. And so a deployment can be built for very bespoke applications. Um, I think one practical problem um, that we've seen to date is that there's a lot of information out there about what blockchain is, but Barney, as you said, that there's perhaps less information out there around how to set up a, a DLT-based solution, mm -hmm. what context um, an application would make sense to, and hopefully that's something that we can address through today's session. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, ultimate key challenges that stakeholders need to grapple with include things like identifying an appropriate motivation, choosing the right scope and application for DLT, and ensuring appropriate governance structure, and also having the correct team and technology um, to, to assist with that deployment. Mm -hmm. That is a, a fantastic scene setting for all of that. I, I could ask about 100 questions as a follow up <laughs> to what you just said, but actually you've laid out the opportunity, but exactly as you, the, the considerations of the journey as well. Um, yeah, um, you know, I, I really hope that we'll be able to elaborate on each of those as we go. But the size of the prize is enormous. Um, but I think what what really resonates with me is you, you mentioned you've got the kind of the multi-billion dollar opportunities of, of you know pick your number with with gazillions of zeros on it. But you've also got the um, the micro level changes in terms of you know much more humble okay, this is what we're going to get done. We're going to take care of this part of the process and we're going to make an impact. That's different from what, you know, the chat was a couple of years ago to say DLT yeah. is going to change, change the financial markets. So, so, Kathy, turning to you then, I mean, so where are you seeing, um, ultimately, where are you kind of seeing the rubber hit the road? Where are you seeing DLT adoption actually take hold, um, given your perspective, which is, you know, it's capital markets, but... but okay. Yeah, actually, um, the statistics that you've mentioned earlier, um, I guess, provides credence to observations you have made in this area over the past years. Um, so ideally, we in Union Bank, we've embraced um, essentially blockchain early as part of our digital transformation before. We've done POCs and pilots, but now all the more, we really want to take this forward. Um, it's not just because we want to see great value in this technology, because, you know, a lot of people have, have seen that, but because we really feel that, you know, with this pandemic, um, it has resulted actually already in a 
um, structural or temporal change in our, not just a temporary change in our economy and the way we interact and do things. Um, so customers, consumers, individuals, businesses are actually expecting this experience, this fast, reliable, and secure way of doing things. And, you know, we feel that, especially those from the customer, from our customer-facing side, um, so where what used to be simple issues now before are now becoming, you know, big issues for many. Um, we see blockchain as a really good candidate for that, if not the only one that can address this. Um, and we know that, you know, we can get the most out of blockchain. And um, as my co-panelist here has mentioned, if, you know, um, we collaborate with different economic actors and it's including, of course, our regulators, because um, to us, especially like for Union Bank, which is a regulated institution, we know that, you know, it's crucial to engage everyone. Um, because especially for anything new or possibly disruptive to the system because you know successful innovation it, it's not about technology it's just it's not about the product it's also it, it also involves as mentioned by matt earlier setting up effective governance from all sides um i guess the challenge is that you know we've everyone um i guess um ha have taken strides already in helping um, move our economies towards becoming more digital. So we've started early, but then, you know, everything just accelerated last year. So just to add to the statistics that you've mentioned, we've entered, you know, we've seen a big jump in the number of households, for example, buying online um, with, with significantly more than half saying that they plan to continue buying online after quarantine restrictions are removed, for example, here in the Philippines. And, you know, we don't have to look that far to see this because we're seeing the same thing happen even in our own households. So, you know, just as the region has led the retail growth engine um, for the last decade, like Asia um, specifically, um, today it's no longer a question of whether people will shop online, but rather how f frequently they buy and how much they will spend. And what does that mean? That means, of course, they expose themselves to different um, risks. Um, which right now I think um, systems are not yet able, capable of, you know, uh, managing. So, for example, the biggest risk, for example, of us going digital would be the risk of identity fraud. So, you know, each, um, so I guess each um, access would require you to provide your own, uh, um, an identity or, or a specific set of requirements. And that what happens is it gets stored in each of these centralized databases that expose you to, you know, identity fraud at each um face or each um access point each channel so i guess this is where um um I, I guess just to conclude what i'm i'm trying to say is that you know there's a big infrastructure gap that this whole um going to digital this whole um digital transformation journey for 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 everyone for all economies um you know that actually hinders development of a digital society and that's essentially on the back end part of things so while well, at the front end it looks so seamless and you know 24 7 it, but what happens at the back as you do there are some manual interventions along the way that you know um all the pain points are now with us it's with us the providers of all of these services and and now you know people get burned out <laughs> and a lot of these things you know happen without the customer knowing. or eventually they find out and they you know just call your customer service saying that you're expected to provide us 24 7 real-time service and now and this is not the experience that we're seeing. So um, we really feel that, you know, this infrastructure gap can be plugged in with the use of emerging technology. And DLT could be just one of these things, but at least there is a starting point. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. No, thank you. That's, that's, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Because I think one of the things that you just finished up on there that I think really resonates across the institutional space as well as the broader financial space is this, is the point that ultimately the providers are the ones wearing the risk today. As you said, we're all the ones typing away furiously with spreadsheets to make up for the, the infrastructure gap. Um, and actually that's, that goes a long way to explaining, I think one of the things that people often say against DLT is, well, the client's not really interested. The client, you know, the end client isn't driving this stuff. Where are they? Where's the investor? But as you rightly said, if this is, you know, if the people wearing the risk are the ones driving the solution, then that's the, that's the banks, the intermediaries in the middle who are effectively using this as risk mitigation, which, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So Ben, um, where are you seeing, equal question, I guess, really, but where are you seeing the rubber hit the road? I mean, in terms of DLT impl implementations and, and, and the real kind of real world take up. Yeah, thanks, Bani. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Bani. Thanks for joining us at this time. So anyway, uh, I agree with uh, both Matthew and Catherine, okay, in the sense that, okay, we mentioned about various uh, opportunities of the DLT where there is a 
efficiency for workflow automation between different companies, different parties, different units. And that's what we are seeing right now, you know, in the sense that we are able to apply the technology to allow these different participants to now allocate the previously locked up capital towards new opportunities, okay, in distribution and liquidity. Because ultimately, there is also a client-driven demand. Okay, so thanks, Barney, for bringing it up. There is, of course, this client-driven demand for uh, certain new opportunities, like, for example, ESG investing. So, you know, a very stucking fact about ESG today is that, okay, although we are already starting to feel the effects of climate change, there is still a 2.5 trillion US dollar funding gap uh, as established by the United Nations um, SDG goals. Okay, and actually, uh, although the sustainable debt uh, market has grown now to about a trillion dollar in size every year, okay, it is still a stucking fact that 0.3% of bonds last year were actually green. Okay, so uh, by the same reason that we could use technology to um, automate some of the workflows, bring about efficiencies in the capital markets, okay, unlocking some part of the $800 billion that's stocked up every single day, we do see the same opportunity being extended to freeing up this capital, these resources, and these um, so-called man hours into okay, more productive, more valuable use cases like, for example, ESG. And that's largely driven about by investor demand. You know, because investors, financial institutions, asset managers today, they are now starting to see the need to be able to have a common platform, a common platform that transcends different projects in different jurisdictions that is able to provide okay, actual and reliable data okay, to combat greenwashing. So we do really see uh, the next step of DLT. Okay, Barney, you mentioned about the um, survey we had last year. So I was part of the survey too. And I was very uh, pleasantly surprised to note that 79% of firms in our industry, in the financial industry, have already dedicated resources. So we do see that you know this year is the, uh, the next phase. Okay, whereby last year, okay, and the years before that, we have already established the need or the value of the DLT. And now, okay, as an industry, we are now already applying such technology to real use cases that will bring about value to the ecosystem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, that's a brilliant broadening of the horizon. That it's so easy to get zoned in on the operational benefits of DLT and kind of it's about, as I opened with really, about processes, about steps, trade fails. But exactly as you said, it's, it's uh, I mean, not to overdo it, but it's good for humanity and it's good for the balance sheet. So um, I'm not sure if those are both good things, but anyway, it's uh, it's good for humanity, which is not a bad thing to be working on. So, so look, thank you very much. I mean, I think we, I mean, we've, that's that's a, a brilliant broad brush of, of really what, what we're looking at here in terms of the scope, the benefits, um, and uh, the kind of key considerations. So drilling into a few of the kind of specific case studies that we're going to walk through. Um, the first one I wanted to walk through is the bonds in a box, um, which is, uh, well, I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, you guys explain this in, in more depth, but, uh, you know, for me, um, what I want to do is just maybe just open with uh, perhaps Ben, you could just talk us through um, your perspective on, on really what, walk us through the Bonds in the Box project for, in terms of what it was before you even got started. What was what was it all for? What was the objectives that you had in mind? And then we'll walk through perhaps the considerations and the implementation journey, if that's right. Thanks, Barney. So Bonds in the Box was a project uh, that we led last year. Okay, uh, it was actually uh, towards tokenizing bonds, putting it on the DLT platform. Uh, we call it bonds in a box because it would be a platform that would have all the activities of the bond lifecycle inside this platform. So of course, uh, we needed to have collaboration from industry participants. So we were quite fortunate, okay, to be able to work with uh, firstly Cathy from Union Bank, okay, and also a few other participants like uh, UBS, Deutsche Bank, and Pusa Malaysia. So I think the greatest value that we have, uh, or the greatest objective that we managed to achieve, okay, is that because we realized that, you know, the bonds market is consists of multiple participants. Uh, interestingly, okay, last week, there's a Financial Times article, just last week, it talks about the various benefits of having the bonds on the blockchain, right? So some of these things that we have already just mentioned about today, but yet challenges remain, okay, with integration. Okay, there's cost in integration for the banks, there's cost for, okay, uh, being able to interoperate with other banks. 
Okay, so that was the uh, pain point that was brought up in that Financial Times article. Okay, and that's exactly okay the objective that we were trying to uh, overcome, which is you know we need to have multiple participants operating in the same platform on the same project because otherwise we are looking at a few other DLT projects that has come before us. They were largely projects that were operating in islands. You know, they were operating in silos where the value of the technology would not be maximized if you we were just operating it alone. Okay, so one remarkable thing is that, you know, we submitted this proposal actually to the MAS. Okay, and we went through some form of an evaluation uh, process where we were managed to get accepted under the MAS Financial Sector Technology Innovation Scheme. FSTI scheme. So that's great uh, because it shows that there's some value that we're going to provide for the industry. Okay, and it's officially under FSTI scheme where, where we were required to publish a report on our achievements. Okay, and but in a nutshell, okay, although this report is on our website right now, in a nutshell, I think the greatest benefit or the objective, as you mentioned, was that we wanted to have multiple participants, uh, multiple uh, banks, okay, operating together in the platform. And if looking back at the project that we have done, I think the greatest uh, satisfaction that we have is that you know we really brought together different participants. For example, Union Bank is a you know retail commercial bank in the Philippines in the emerging market where there's a large uh, number of uh, users. Okay, so that's coming from a perspective of a retail commercial bank. And uh, UBS is a ranger bank. Okay, from the wealth management uh, perspective. Okay, large wealth manager, large investment bank, large bond ranger bank. We had Deutsche Bank which is a great custodian, global custodian, okay, service provider. We also have Busa Malaysia, which is a exchange and also a CSD, where we were able to really capture the entire life cycle of the bond into a single platform. So I think that was something that we felt was really uh, useful in terms of evaluating the practicality of the technology for the capital market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, I mean, that, that whole point, you know, going back to Matt's earlier points around just, you know, avoiding the, the, the opportunities for information gaps between all of those parties, suddenly you're into a, a whole range of benefits. So, Cathy, from your perspective, obviously, as being a participant of this project, how did the project look from your perspective in terms of, I guess, first of all, what you, what you came in expecting and, and how, did, how did the kind of chronology of the project play out from, from, from your angle as a, as a kind of core part of it? Yeah, okay. So maybe um, to help um, here, I, I'd like to give context as to why we joined um, this, this project. <clears throat> so essentially, it's part of our DNA to participate in projects like this. So collaboration and innovation, I think these are our top two um priorities and also values here in, in the bank so it's really part of our makeup as we take you know our mission of helping tech up the philippines very seriously so overall goal was really to co-create solutions for a better world and we know that the only way to do this is uh, essentially through collaboration so right now for example in the financial services industry like the biggest hurdle and challenge towards fully realizing economic prosperity for example um is financial inclusivity um, so we know that the technology itself, blockchain or DLT's attributes, make a good candidate to help us with this. So in the Philippines, this is actually multiplied 10 times um, by being a country you know, separated by water into more than 7,000 islands. So we know that you know, DLT blockchain has been there for quite some time, but it hasn't gone beyond proof of concepts or pilots. We participated here because the goal wasn't just a proof of concept, but it was clear at the start that it was a proof of commercialization. So something that can be really applied. Um, from a practical point of view, so something, you know, deployable and scalable in the real world. I think people are already getting tired of, you know, just POCs, prototypes, and we were hoping, because you can't get a lot of these things from just prototypes, right? Like all these learnings come from actual and practical executions. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, these can really address these challenges. And we know that with such a big problem, we can't do it alone. We really need to come together with, with the Stacks team, for example, with the other banking participants, um, if there is, uh, you know, a solution for that, that is kind of sustainable for all participants and also relevant, of course, to our bosses, our customers at the end of the day. So we're seeing increasing interest in the area of applications in the capital markets. Um, as, as you know, maybe over the past um, year, we've seen a lot of institutions now looking into, uh, especially on the banking side, DLT in the capital markets, primarily led by the quest for these institutions to remain relevant to our customers. Because, you know, a lot say that the existing archaic infrastructure, which was, you know, built over a span of 20 years, no longer allows us to keep up with what customers want and are expecting, as mentioned earlier, um, they wanted 24-7 availability, real-time, personalized experiences. 
Um, and you know what used to be standard and expected settlement and issuance processes that takes usually roughly um, two weeks to, to a month to, to, to finish are now considered huge pain points. But this is from the perspective of both the issuer and the selling agents because the consumers or the investors are really changing. Um, and these pain points now translate to higher costs passed on essentially to the clients, which result to customer dissatisfaction and over time contribute to, you know, as, as mentioned again, financial exclusivity. Um, which, you know, if not addressed, so simply pushes them to either transact with, you know, the low friction but riskier unregulated sectors. And of course, being a trusted institution, we want to, of course, bring our customers back to the trusted and regulated system. Mm, mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I, I've never actually heard the term financial exclusivity before, but it makes so much sense. It's uh, we talk about inclusion so much, but of course you've got a, you've got the, the yeah a prevailing problem that needs to be addressed first. So so we, we've kind of so if we describe the platform in terms of bonds in a box, obviously it's uh, as Ben as you said, it's about getting the bond um, issued. Um, distributed out uh, through the book runners into the uh, end investors' hands. And Kathy, to your point, it's about delivering uh, on all of the benefits that you just mentioned or re removing all of the issues that you just mentioned in terms of huge, ex excessively long settlement times, uh, manual processing, all this kind of thing. Um, across that cycle, um, what was, and maybe for Ben, I guess, really, what was the where, where do you find the center of gravity was in terms of the, the real payoffs? You know, as you know, Kathy mentioned this is proof of commercialization, so you're not aiming to just do this once and forget about it. Um, where, where do you find the real payoffs were? Because obviously, that I'm sure it's not equally wonderful in every single area. But where are the major benefits, and, and how would you kind of quantify those as outcomes? Yeah, so a few major payoffs where we recognize was that firstly uh, just uh, the, uh, adding on to Cathy's point about the proof mm -hmm. of commercialization we were able to at least uh, establish the feasibility you know while we had multiple banks involved and we had a technology platform that was interoperable you know through apis with various systems so this could be external payment systems this could be external platforms that the banks may be using Right. So this is where we wanted to, at the very least, okay, establish the feasibility, okay, to be able to, okay, run the entire project in a live commercial sense, okay, from end to end. So that alone is a great achievement because, uh, because uh, one point about the uh, firms wanting to use DLT today, many of them requires, you know, this technology to also be interoperable with existing infrastructure. We can't just create another island or another market, you know, which is not accessible by traditional uh, liquidity. Yeah, so that was one thing, okay, where we don't want, we do not want to sacrifice liquidity for the sake of innovation. Now, to the point about innovation then, okay, we were also able to uh, quantify some of the processes, I would say, processes in the uh, bond issuance process where we were able to save Okay, so uh, there's as much as okay, uh, there's there's uh, as much as more than sixty percent savings in terms of the number of process steps. Yeah, sixty percent in terms of the number of process steps, and this is even with a process where you are integrating with traditional infrastructure. Okay, so mm -hmm. in other words, if we were able, okay, to one day, okay, make this the infrastructure. Of course, the efficiencies will be higher. But of course, that's many, many years down the road. Okay, the more important thing is that, as, I, as we mentioned, we do not want to uh, overhaul or replace uh, liquidity today. So that's why, okay, we want to have some form of a hybrid model where there is still an interface with traditional liquidity and traditional infrastructure. But yet, on our platform, we are able to quantify various business steps, processes that are safe, okay, for the participants. Mm. Yeah. Sixty yep. percent. Yeah, that's um, that's quite meaningful. And presumably, I mean, that that sixty percent range is all the way down to, you know, Kathy's point. You know, fast. You know, that the ultimately the bonds landing, settling in end investors' accounts. You know, weeks faster than they otherwise would have been without without settlement risk and obviously without all of the funding challenges that that brings with it. So you know, benefits to all the way along the chain. So maybe. Matthew, from your perspective, as you look at this kind of project, um, where do you see the the, the kind of the, the, where do you see this going? Because ultimately, there's there's a lot of challenges and limitations around the legal role, the regulatory role mm -hmm. of the LT. Um, you know what can be what what a token constitutes. Um, you know 
if this is proof of commercialization, where do you feel this is going, this kind of goes in the next three, five years um, from sure. a material applications perspective? Sure. So I, I guess what this is where there's maybe a little bit of a friction from a um, an ecosystem perspective in the sense of, well, I mean, you mentioned things like law, tax, regulation. But th th those are things that um, historically have been largely um, legislated on a reactive basis. Um, mm -hmm. And traditional legal concepts don't always map nicely onto some of the, um, the, the, the changing business models um, that we're seeing. As in my day role with Deloitte and as a, as a, um, a tax professional providing structuring advice, one of the things that I invariably have to do is basically really understand how the technology works at a granular level. And then, if, um, and then once I've done that, figure out how it maps onto legal tax regulatory type considerations. Um, because the reality is that um, what law and regulation that we have at the moment was never really designed for these types of applications. And there isn't always a, a nice dovetail with um, the rules that we currently have. I think what we find is that generally, notwithstanding that, um, the, the rules um, that we generally have to um, live and abide by do largely work, but there's usually quite a lot of diligence needed in order to figure out how they apply to specific contexts um, and, and how business models then need to be sensitive to what those particular requirements are. I guess looking at things from a more um, uh, helicopter level, I guess, um, and from a policy perspective, I think one of the key things that we really get back to is um, what does impactful regulatory support look like? Because I think if we have that impactful regulatory support, then hopefully things like um, changes to legislation, changes to tax rules, et cetera, will then follow in due course. The regulatory aspect is perhaps more of a gating issue at the moment, given that um, tax rules, legal rules, et cetera, it, it's usually possible to navigate around those and, and to implement in a way that is um, both legal and potentially tax efficient. Regulatory rules can actually be more of a blocker. Um, so when it comes to um, being able to implement these types of solutions, that the, the role of the regulator really is important. Um, I think there's, there's a number of different aspects to impactful regulatory support. Um, the approach taken in Singapore um, in particular is interesting because it takes account of all of the different <clears throat> facets that are relevant um, in, the, in the overall um, sort of analysis. So it comprises a combination of direct regulatory interaction in a way to make sure that regulation is not a limiting factor and the role of the regulator is more facilitative. Um, it also takes account of market facilitation and also, as, as Ben mentioned, um, potentially even funding and proofs of concepts. Mm. Now, in, in terms of using maybe Singapore as a, as a, as a case study, because um, um, that's perhaps what we're most familiar with, um, a prominent initiative is the MAS's regulatory sandbox, um, which is based on a similar initiative deployed in the UK. Um, for those um, attendees that are not familiar with the sandbox, um, that enables DLT and other fintech deployments relevant to, finance, uh, to regulated activities to be tested in a controlled environment with the oversight of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Um, and that also provides the benefit of real-time feedback, um, which can be used to adapt and improve solutions um, on a real-time basis in a way that then aligns with the regulator's supervisory approach. Um, if we look at the market facilitation aspect, um, one way that is being handled in Singapore is through the development and launch of the API exchange platform, which is um, a platform which is jointly being developed by the ASEAN Financial Innovation Network, um, which is a not-for-profit entity um, formed by the MAS, the World Bank Group and the ASEAN Bankers Association. Um, that platform is intended to support financial innovation in ASEAN, but also more generally globally. Um, it, it's basically a platform that allows financial institutions and fintechs to connect with each other easily and cost effectively. And it also contains its own sandbox, um, which enables financial institutions and fintechs to connect with each other easily um, 
um, in different in different ways to validate solutions in different scenarios and facilitate adoption and deployments. Then the, the final piece of the puzzle from a um, from a Singapore perspective goes to um, the, the funding side of things. So um, from um, from that perspective, to support proofs of concepts um, conducted through the API exchange, um, a business growth grant has been made available by the AM, uh, DMAS and AMTD. Um, the Singapore FinTech Association administers that grant. Um, the grant provides FinTechs with funding for um, proofs of concept. Um, the, the, the number is higher for the initial uh, for an initial proof of concept, and then there's um, funding for additional proof of concepts up to a maximum of, of 80,000 Singapore dollars. Um, the relevant grant schemes also exist. Um, if, if anybody on the, um, in the audience is interested, there is actually a list and summary of the relevant grants available on the, on the website of the Singapore FinTech Association. Um, that's accessible from the homepage uh, of the SFA. Um, another prominent um, grant, which I do want to just touch on is, um, is one that Ben has actually just mentioned, which was relevant directly to the Bonds in a Box um, project, which is the, the MAS's Financial Sector Technology and Innovation Proof of Concept Scheme, um, which it's a bit of a mouthful, um, the FSTI POC for short. Um, that scheme enables funding support for experimentation, development, deployment of new tech in the financial services sector through to 2023. Now, the scheme provides up to 70% um, subsidy of qualifying costs, up to a maximum um, capped amount of 400,000 Singapore dollars. Um, eligible applications comprise MAS regulated financial institutions um, and fintech solution providers working with such financial institutions. So I think there's there's a whole bunch of different um, factors and 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 um, sort of aspects to mm -hmm. uh, from sort of a legal tax regulatory perspective. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, I think the regulatory is really important. In Singapore, we do have a supportive regulator from a policy perspective. The growth of fintech is very much supported. Um, the types of things that I've just mentioned really do play into that. Hopefully, um, we'll start to uh, as um, sort of deployments become more commonplace, um, things like um, le legal um, rules, potentially even tax rules will take into account these developments um, and also contribute to the policy um, objectives. Mm. But it's really interesting actually, because so much of that, to your point, you know, reg the regulatory landscape can be, you know, from, as you say, a gating issue in terms of just an immediate disqualifier, but actually, on the other hand, it can be such a critical enabler to success when you've got, you know, a supportive regulatory environment, funding available, and as you said, the real kind of hands-on help that, that, that is available in different markets. It, it presumably then is, is, a, is a pretty big part of the overall success story. Um, yeah, completely. You know, and, and sorry, but one, one point to, to maybe just draw out is historically the, the approach of, of regulators has been um, paternal in the sense that they, they monitor what's going on, it's been reactive. I think one thing um, that we can perhaps all expect to see as things move forward, um, maybe in the five, next five to 10 years, maybe beyond that, is that the role of the regulator potentially needs to change so that it's less paternal and it becomes much more of a real-time enabler um, rather than um, being a limiting factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, so on the the bonds in a box, we could talk for hours about uh, you know digging into more depth. I, I you know, I, I would, I'm sure there are many people who want to know why where you did struggle along the journey, and also what the sixty percent was made up of. But in the consciousness of time, I want to move on to the second case, which is um, the green stacks, uh, stacks and stacks of green bonds everywhere. Um, because I think this is, it's, it's as you mentioned in the opening, Ben, a really, really key piece in terms of broadening people's perceptions of what DLT is really there for. So perhaps um, equally to, to, to dig into that one, um, again, maybe Ben, can you just uh, give us the, the overview of ultimately, um, you know, the lie of the land? Why why does green stacks exist? And ultimately, what, what are the problems that uh, you are now solving in the present tense, I guess? Mm, thanks, Barney. So yeah, so as we were talking about the bonds in the box, we deployed a ledger, you know, a digital ledger that is common across participants that would be able to 
uh, house the various smart contracts that are you know enforcing uh, certain efficiencies in the processes. So naturally, one thing led to another. When we look at how we should apply this, okay, naturally the concept of green bonds came about, and it was all perfect timing because at the end of last year, you know, uh, there's been more and more uh, what do you call uh, publicity around the concept of uh, ESG financing. As of, of course, this isn't anything new, but I guess that uh, with the pandemic, there's been a renewed focus on anything digital. And you know, in Singapore especially, I think we are very uh, blessed to be in Singapore with a lot of support from the MAS. MAS has actually announced a project green print whereby they would be committing some funding to support <clears throat> industry implementations of technology that will enhance ESG financing. So uh, naturally, I felt that, you know, uh, from our company's perspective, okay, it was easy to extend our functionality to support that. And it's also something that we resonates with, okay, it resonates with us, okay, as a company, whereby we wanted to use technology, okay, to make societies better, to make uh, the planet more sustainable. Right. Okay. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any planet left. So that's where we are able to under, understand how our technology can be able to be effective in supporting the provenance. For example, tracking and tracing of okay the entire uh, so-called distribution channel and supply chain. Okay, of physical real-world projects. Okay, from manufacturing to destination. Okay, we are able okay to to provide our di distributed infrastructure to allow connectivity to various data sources. So this could be. IoT sources, this could be data analytics, this could be satellites, which is continuously monitoring, okay, real time, uh, in real time projects as they develop. So it's not just only at the point of applying for the bond or applying for the loan. It's actually throughout the process, throughout the project's lifetime. Okay, such that investors, you know, investors, uh, which we talk about at the beginning, you know, they have this demand to be sure that their portfolio is really green and there's no greenwashing involved. So as they are investing into a bond, a sustainable bond or a green bond, or if they are financing a debt, you know, a sustainable debt, okay, uh, loan, for example, okay, they want to be able to see that this use of proceeds have translated to real KPIs, translated to real results. Okay, and while we are doing so, Okay, as we are receiving the data, as we are receiving data analytics, uh, applying data analytics, as we are getting third party certification, okay, from the certification agencies, okay, it could be Matt at Deloitte, okay. So as all of these are being done, this platform now becomes the common platform that will be able to provide green certifications as a service, whereby we are now uh, able to allow for more participants, more corporates to now get involved in the green market. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known how. So hopefully this platform that we are trying to build will become a platform as a service. Okay, will become a green uh, uh, financing as a service where participants are therefore able to easily quantify and show, okay, reliably, okay, their project greenness such that they are able to get better financing. And this is the last point. While they are doing so, okay, the amount of carbon emissions that they are able to offset, for example, could actually become carbon credits as long as it's being uh, reported and being calculated in the industry standard way. So there's a lot of different ways that we see our technology helping okay, in the ESG fund. And we see ourselves as the nexus, okay, a nexus between the financial industry and the real world projects to bring all together in a common uh, digital platform. So that's something mm. that we're really excited about. Mm. And so, you know, and so absolutely, and you've already answered the question that I wanted to really drill into, which is ultimately why on earth DLT and ESG is a six letter abbreviation. But, you know, um, I think exactly as you said, the surety and the provenance and, and ultimately where that ends up is driving up basically, as you said, access to funding, um, supply of projects, um, and also liquidity, presumably in the market. I mean, Matt, from your perspective, across the across the overall marketplace, I mean, again, in terms of we shift straight to outcomes. Um, you know, where where are the real outcomes of this? In terms of where have you seen the real payoffs um, as a marketplace as this is as, as hit the road? I mean, it could have many many benefits, but how do how do the benefits actually materialize? Sure. So I I, I think what what Ben said captures um, sort of a whole variety of aspects, and to be honest, I'm not sure I can um usefully add much to that I, th I think from a from a market perspective if we look at um sort of the applications of of green bonds etc i mean what one of the rationales for this is that um it, it's really maybe a, a cost of funding play for um for uh bond issuers i.e if they're able to 
um, demonstrate that um, the, the the use of funds is is actually um, g- generating a return that can be directly tied back to some economic uh, to some environmental or social benefit. Um, then from an investor perspective, investors may be more willing to provide funding at perhaps lower interest rates with lesser protections, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think what uh, what Ben mentioned about surety and provenance is really what underlines that and really makes that possible. So I think at the moment, there's this term greenwashing that I think seems to have become um, quite standard in an ESG context in the sense that it, it can be based on traditional technologies and processes, very difficult to try and demonstrate how use of funds um, directly tie back to those environmental or um, societal type outcomes. But once you start automating the data capture um, and then you plug that information straight through in an automated way to a a blockchain-based immutable record, it takes the human element out of things in a way that then gives you a, a greater level of surety and provenance. Um, and it, it, in that case, it's much easier to then demonstrate that the um, sort of the non-financial objectives that are being marketed in connection with a bond issuance, for example, are then being um, complied with in a way that should then justify um, sort of the lower cost of funding, etc. Um, it also obviously enables um, investors to potentially see, potentially to see um, in a much more transparent way how their funds are directly being applied. Um, and I think um, g- given the, the trend toward sort of greater levels of um, accountability, um, especially um, from an environmental perspective, these types of applications can be expected to just become commonplace over time. I think mm-hmm. at the moment, we're really at the beginning of the story whereby um, where, um, stakeholders are looking at um, implementing these solutions. And we've got the market actually starting to issue more of these types of bonds. But I think as time progresses, um, my own view is that these types of expectations will become commonplace um, and it will, people will have to then start um, to expect to pay higher costs of funding if they don't have these things. So I think, I I think we'll gradually start to see um, a change in dynamic between this being um, a potential um, uh, sort of additional factor to try and um, obtain funding Mm-hmm. Um, and effectively, essentially become a, a commonplace benchmark standard that the entire financial services industry is going to have to comply with mm-hmm. um, in order to uh, help um, issuers um, achieve levels of funding that they're looking for. Mm. Brilliant. No, thank you, Jet. So absolutely. So if I understand right, on the, on the supply side, you've got better access to liquidity, um, as you said, you know, better cost of funding. And ultimately, I could completely see, as you say, that it, be, it becomes ultimately the, a, a market standard instead of a market exception at the moment. So look, so we've got two fantastic usage cases there really already. Um, we've talked about, you know, bonds in the box. Sixty um, percent reductions in in processes, you know, um, green stacks in terms of you know the the the, the really in driving up the market liquidity, driving up the access to finance for market participants, so on and so forth. It's all good. Um, both of those have been realised. So now that the projects have both been have come to fruition, we can talk about what didn't go right. Um, so, Kathy, maybe from your perspective, you know, the challenge of deploying these these platforms in both cases is no doubt it's not a straight line. It never is. You know, particularly I think given what we were talking about before in terms of connecting to old world infrastructures, the you know the, the infrastructure gap that you were mentioning at the beginning. Where did you? In the, in the deployment journey of the various DLT platforms that you've used, where do you find you run up against challenges? Where are the you know, people joining who are listening to this call, where do they need to be taking notes in terms of, right, these are the things I should be on the lookout for as things that are going to stress me out in the next six months? Well, actually, well, the first challenge usually that we've experienced is no, well, not the challenge, but also an opportunity at the same time, um, is that there clearly is a need to educate people on this new technology. So there is like still a gap between, so we've, we've um, all digitized, I guess, in, in some 
way or another, but there uh, there is still a gap that exists between business and technology. So I guess the next hurdle now is in the real world, like how do you get participants to really jump in these wonderful platforms and you know work together for a common goal? Um, you co competition, they say it, it's an nice word, right? It sounds right, um, but for some reason it, it's very difficult to do because we're not raised that way. Um, so it needs like a change of mindset, I guess, um, from more. Uh, not so far going beyond silo silo thinkings um to a more horizontal um i guess thinking across all participants across the ecosystem um it, we need to go beyond our self-interest for the interest of the whole um especially for example in the capital market infrastructure and in the payments infrastructure um so it, it encompasses everything all ecosystems also you have to be able to open up i guess to a sharing economy that we're not used to that you know could eventually um, that, you know, before we get eaten up by this new emerging economy, essentially. And for regulated institutions, I guess the challenge is even bigger um, because we want, we have to be able to navigate the current rules. The thing is, we really want to be regulated. Um, we've earned the regulators' trust um, for decades and we don't want to break that trust. So I believe, you know, as, as Matt has mentioned, the sandboxes are really very important. And I think collaborative regulation is, is also a necessary and, and a good thing. And we probably will be seeing and we hope to see more of these things happen over time. Mm. So Ben, you know, similar question to you, I guess, go back a, a year or 18 months. Where have you lost or where has you either lost hair or where has it gone gray because of, uh, because of what stressed you out? Yep. So it's always a process. Yep. So as uh, Cathy mentioned, it's also an opportunity. You know, while mm -hmm. we started on this journey, we actually started in 2019. And I would like to say that uh, there was a time where actually most institutions have really warmed up to the idea. Okay, because they had already done some experiments before. Uh, the uh, challenge, of course, is that many of them have done experiments and have gotten not much out of it. Yeah, because those were the earlier days where, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk, but there's not too much results or traction. So of course, we are now in the stage where there's been a lot more progress made. Okay, and that's because I think uh, being a second mover, as I have to say, okay, we are able to learn from some of the experiences and lessons of uh, certain implementations that have didn't um, so-called maximize the potential of technology. We were able to try to provide something as we call it in a box, okay, as something that is interoperable, something that uh, we wanted to be able to solve the existing pain points of implementing the tech. Yeah, so that's something that we, we actually brought it upon ourselves as a challenge and also as an opportunity to learn from the lessons of uh, certain other experiences that the banks have been sharing with us, okay, to build a better product that they will be able to take in uh, immediately. Mm. Yeah. And so that, that's one of the things I've been thinking as we've been talking is how ready are the financial institutions to be able to to consume what's being produced? You know, in the ESG case, we're talking about you know, an incredible level of transparency and visibility on, on the provenance of the bond and, the, and the, the, you know, satellite tracking, satellite imaging, all this kind of stuff. You know, you throw that against a, a, a 1990s mainframe system or, a, you know, 2000s risk management system that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a generation apart. How are they, how are the organizations able to consume the information that's being thrown at them? Is that a challenge, do you find, Ben? Uh, interestingly, when speaking to many financial institutions, ultimately they just want the information ready. You know, it could be a, a platform that somebody else has done, has built. Okay, it could be an exchange, but whatever it is, they are just interested to have somebody verifying it on some platform that's been uh, universally or accepted by the industry. Yeah, mm. so that's something that is an opportunity again for us. You know, whereby institutions, they just need the end result, whereby it's certified, it's verified, it is credible, okay? And it's something that they can be able to take in and use the results immediately. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. And Kathy, from your perspective, in terms of, you know, the, how the, the, the benefits materialize onto the end, the end investor, ultimately, the end consumer. I mean, I suppose similarly, how, how apparent are the benefits to them? How ready are, are the end consumers able to benefit from this? Or is it really just more kind of, as you were saying earlier on, the service provider basically running fewer risks and having to do less manual rekeying kind of thing? Well, I guess I can say that we are quite happy with the progress that we're seeing in some of our blockchain projects, um, initiatives um, such as um, the bank's blockchain-enabled financial supply chain. 
I know it has been very instrumental in terms of helping our SMEs and MSMEs recover from the economic challenges brought about by the pandemic. So through mm-hmm. some anchor clients, we're able to you know, finance small businesses, especially during these difficult times in a way that is community-based. Um, so based on trust within their own set of communities. We're also happy with our blockchain-enabled um, payment ecosystem of rural banks, which we call eye to i or island to island So we've connected them. Um, through using blockchain and using our PHX, our stable coin. So through this network, we were actually um, able to help distribute government funding also during the height of the pandemic and lockdown to, to those who are you know, in, in the rural areas. So glad that you know, most of these applications allowed us to not just remain relevant to our customers, but you know, help, really help our ailing Filipinos during that time. So as you've mentioned, there are some though where ap- adoption of DLT is, is pretty slow. Um, as in the case of the bond markets, for example, where regulation is tighter, but you know, with merit, of course, they have the box stops with them, with the regulators, so they have to really exercise um, controls there. Um, and as a regulated entity, as mentioned, you don't want to break that trust. But we're happy to see you know conversations going on here and there. And you know, it's you know, it's not a matter of 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 if, but you know, just when um they're gonna be ready. So I I don't think it's gonna be there soon, I guess, for the capital markets, but it's gonna get there because you know. Um, there are discussions going on and discussions are healthy if the discussions are between you know different participants even competitors so mm. yeah i guess that's it mm. and it's i guess it's important that you know we're open to innovation and collaboration for us to be able to experience really meaningful change in this area mm. so yeah mm. i guess that's it for me yeah no and i mean yeah so ultimately so it's not just basically it's not just benefits materializing within the financial institutions as you said across the philippines there are people who are really benefiting from this in terms of financial inclusion access to the markets in a way that was just physically impossible before yeah and so maybe just to round off i mean you know i guess for me one of the the the, the continuing questions in my mind is is still the, the old technology and new technology um and how much you know how much we this is a limitation today and how much we can expect that to change in the next few years. So, you know, as we've said, we're running, we're running into old technology. Ben, you were saying that from a bonds in a box, you know, that one of the biggest, you know, you were able to deliver 60% benefits, but ultimately that could have been much, much higher had you been, you know, had the change been more profound. Where do we feel we are just in terms of that journey of, of realizing, you know, how, do the quantum, how does the quantum of benefits grow from 60% over the next few years? Are we seeing that because of the fact that, you know, that, you know, we are coming together to Cathy's point more effectively, that those benefits can go from 60 to 90% efficiencies? Are we, are we expecting more incremental change? Um, where, what is the, I suppose, what does the journey look like based on the fact that all three of you are seeing this change happen every day and you know what the pace of it looks like? So I, maybe Matt, if that's not too vague a question for you. No, that's fine. So, I mean, I, I, I guess if we look at where we are today, um, I think the reality is to a certain extent that there's, there's maybe still perhaps some lingering association between blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. But that is really changing amongst corporate stakeholders. And and based on what I see, the the number of enterprise use cases really seems to be um, increasing and and such use cases are much um, more being actively explored. I think the persistent question is what the relative benefits of 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 a deployment are, um, which will naturally vary case by case depending on the motivation for an implementation and its objectives. Um, I think financial services stakeholders um, will increasingly implement um, DLT-based products and solutions. And I I think going back to your point, uh, Barney, how do we get from 60% to 90%? I I, I think that as as uptake grows, the gap between DLT um, and tech-enabled solutions and non-DLT tech-enabled solutions will gradually increase. Um, to the point that over time, deployments might become more business critical um, than optional. Um, So I think as of today, many financial institutions are still grappling with legacy systems concerns. DLT deployments typically need to produce significant upside benefits to justify deployment. Um, and, And that maybe then impacts deployments not being as commonplace as they theoretically could be. 
But I think as we see implementations becoming more commonplace in the context of new products and service lines, um, we'll, we'll start to see that gap increasing and that, and that business critical nature of a deployment start to become um, much more of a focal point. So I think as the competitive gap increases, that of itself will create a, a certain amount of momentum, which will then lead to a greater level of acceptance and adoption. Um, I think that th there's maybe a point around um, scalability and performance requirements, um, which I think um, tech providers um, are still grappling with. But I think it's only a matter of time before those um, uh, the, the solutions to those types of issues are are um, uh, sort of identified. And I think by the time that those are identified, my, my hope is that um, enterprise will essentially be in a place where they're more ready from a business perspective to actually then move forward to a deployment. So I think there's a few factors to this. I think if we look at the landscape today, there are still a few frictions, but if we compare today's environment with the environment one, two, three years ago, there is clearly development. And I think as we um, start to see that greater level of development, that will then drive a further level of, of um, sort of interest and implementation that will create um, further momentum for others to then pick up and deploy themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, Kathy, where do you feel we are in terms of, uh, you know, that, do you feel that we are in that, in that kind of virtuous circle that Matt's kind of describing? Um, yeah, I think like there seems to be an agreement that, you know, certain infrastructures badly need an upgrade. So, and, and for my point of view, I, I think it doesn't need a major overhaul to plug this gap. Um, I think that, you know, it, there could be like tweak, tweaks here and there in the case of the bond markets, you know, huge benefits will already accrue if you tweak the process for just a few points of the entire bond life cycle, for example, focusing on allocation and the reconciliation side. Um, but at the same time, it, it has to be plugged. Um, it, it, it doesn't, and there are tools right now, it's new and emerging, it needs to be tested, not as digital islands as Ben mentioned earlier, but to test it as an ecosystem. And I think um, by doing this as a first step, by looking at, you know, um, points of these um, life cycles of infrastructures or ecosystems, you can already like increase that um, value from probably the 60 to the 90 that you're talking about. Because yeah. the 30% could be there, just in the two parts of like the, the entire cycle. Yeah. But that that is so i think it's it's easy to overlook but what you just said is so key is you know the benefits from just tweaking the, the tweaking the overall flow uh, and not looking to reinvent and transform is 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 so fundamental i think that it's and this is where i think personally where so much of the messaging and, and the, the scopes of dlt projects go wrong is you know trying to reinvent an entire industry as opposed to just tweaking it in a few specific points and realizing some immediate benefits from that so thank you uh, for making that point. Yeah, Ben, you know, from your perspective, rounding off then, um, connecting old world, new world, how how much are we being held back, and how much uh, how much do you think we're going to be able to make in terms of progress in moving that sixty percent bar in the next two years, let's say? Yeah, uh, I'm actually very optimistic. But firstly, even on that sixty percent number, okay, it is actually an entire end-to-end -end summary. I would say, within this sixty percent, okay, there are certain parts of the process that is as high as ninety percent. You know, mm -hmm. just that overall is a sixty percent because there are certain parts that are still done in the off-chain or offline manner anyway, with or without DLT. Yep. So I do see these sixty percent being very valuable to some parts of the financial industry. Uh, that's already delivering great enabling value. And secondly, besides that, okay, there are a lot of more resources that could now more. Be, could be put and focused into the ESG element, for example. Okay, resources, money, time, okay, could now be spent on more productive and more strategic opportunities that will bring along top line revenue growth, okay, to the institutions. So that's actually two different things that I'm looking at right now in the sense that even if we remain where we are, where we integrate with traditional financial infrastructure at certain moments of the life cycle, with certain interfacing points uh, throughout the process, it is actually fine. 
okay, because we are already bringing about great change and great value, okay, to the market. Additional liquidity, uh, benefits for distribution. Of course, if we uh, talk about a true 90% efficiency world, that will be really a few more years down the road. But at the very least, I think that the fact that we have already started on the uh, journey where institutions are live on the platform, it simply means that the barrier, okay, has been overcome, okay. Onwards, it's just an incremental change rather than an overhauling change. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, yeah, it's a really excellent way of framing it. That uh, if I've got you right, that ultimately that the DLT case is really it's a P and L change. It's not just a it's not just a cost center change. That ultimately, across you know the increasing the returns on capital, increasing your product distribution and operational efficiencies, it's. It's it's not, it's it's a jaw effect. It's not it's not just basically just uh, reducing some operational costs. And that, that's a fantastic way to round out because I think that captures I, I believe what kathy has been saying and also what Matt's been saying. So yeah, look. So we've we've gone through. Uh, I I think and I hope for the people participating and listening. You know, a, a, a lot of stuff. You know, ultimately just to recap quickly before we go into the breakout rooms. You know, for me, I think the. You, you've got a, a, a great two great examples, um, both you know setting out to reframe the business case for DLT, um, as we were saying just now, uh, reforming around a PNL change, not just about costs but about income as well. Um, you know, ultimately all of them based around an ecosystem play. You know, for me that's what really stands out, both in terms of opportun opportunities and challenges. Um, you get the ecosystem together. Um, and as Cathy says, you start looking to tweak the system and tweak the processes um, rather than reinventing them, you can suddenly end up with, with a really important um, impact, not just on your operating costs, your cost of capital, but also the number of people that you touch with the technology, the number of people that can touch financial products, and ultimately the reach of the solutions. And if you can do all that with a regula friendly regulator down the road, then you're very, very lucky. So um, I hope that's a reasonable summary. What we're going to do now is Grace is just going to talk us through briefly um, how the breakout rooms are going to work. But the intent, I think, is really to take the uh, expertise of the three panelists and myself uh, to uh, a greater level of conversation and depth, get you to answer all the questions that you've no doubt got um, so that this whole session can be as impactful as we possibly can make it.